Hi everyone, welcome to this week's Azure update. It's the 10th of January. Not a huge number of updates this week, but some pretty impactful ones. So I'll go into a little bit more detail than maybe normally I would because we have the time and I think because they're so interesting. New videos this week, it's a new year. So I've started to update my Azure Masterclass. So I updated the introduction module and the foundational module that goes into cloud and some Azure basics. And obviously my plan is over the next few months to update the entire course. I also did a video on what singularity means. It's being thrown around a lot right now in terms of artificial intelligence. So just a quick video there. And then a little mentoring video, so not technology related, but it's the new year. Um, lots of us have resolutions for the new year. So I go into just a few minutes thoughts about how to think about being successful in your changes. So uh, may find that useful. So on to the actual updates. So Azure Container Storage is a service built specifically to provide storage services for AKS in a very efficient and optimized manner. And it's now possible to collect the associated metrics for the Azure Container Storage for the various storage pools and the disks that make up the service into the Azure Monitor Managed Prometheus service. And then once it's in that service, I can very easily view and query that data using the Azure Managed Grafana. Now the metrics should automatically be collected where I have the AC store present, which is the Azure Container Storage components it installs on the cluster. Um, where I have the Azure Managed Prometheus enabled. No other actions are required. So carrying on on the storage side, so for Azure NetApp files, the minimum has been increased from what was 100 gigabytes to 50 gigabytes minimum volume size. So what this really does is reduce the barrier to entry for being able to start leveraging Azure NetApp files. So I would no longer have to pay, for example, for 100 gigabyte volume if I actually didn't need that much. I'm avoiding wasting space in the capacity pool from which that volume's capacity is actually taken. Remember, with Azure NetApp files, we have the account, which lives in a specific region. Under the account, I then create one or more capacity pools, and that capacity pool is of a specific tier and then an amount of capacity with that. And then I create volumes from that specific capacity pool. And this new volume size is available in all regions. And also now for Azure Files, we have this provisioned V2 billing model for standards. So remember, Azure Files is one of the services available as part of a storage account, along with blob and queues and tables. And for the standard, i.e. the hard disk drive based tier, we normally pay based on the actual amount of consumed capacity and the various operations we perform against it. Only if I use the premium, i.e. the SSD based offering, do we have a provision based billing, where I pay for the amount of capacity provisioned, which then has a corresponding IOPS and throughput. And I'm not paying for the amount of actual capacity used. Well, with this new V2 provision billing option, now this does apply only for standard and not premium today. It allows the independent provisioning of capacity, IOPS and throughput, think separate dials. I can also dynamically change the IOPS and throughput whenever you want, although there are some limitations on when you can scale down. When I go and create a V2 provision file share, it will give recommendations for the IOPS and the throughput based on the capacity you select, but I can change it. I can change it later on as needs may change or as my needs become more apparent. Additionally, I can accrue IOPS credit. So, hey, I've provisioned a certain amount of IOPS. If I use less than that provisioned amount, well, I start to accrue IOPS credit in my bucket and I can then burst and consume IOPS from that bucket on a best efforts basis when I have some peak amount of IOPS I need to use. Now I have to set the option to use provision V2 at the storage account creation time. Let's just jump over quickly. 
So here we can see I'm actually looking at a storage account. Now what I have to do here is I have to pick the primary service as Azure Files. It has to be standard. And then once I have this, as we can see, I now have this option to select provisioned V2. So it's something I'm setting at the storage account level. And what this will actually do is also result in me having a file storage account kind and a V2 storage account SKU. So it does do some changes based on that. There are limited regions today, uh, which are outlined in the documentation. But then once I've created this, if I just jump back out of here and actually try and find my account, notice I can only now create file shares because it's been created as a files type. So I can only create file shares. But now what it will do is when I want to create a new file share, it's actually showing me because there was limits on a storage account. So it's tracking, hey, based on the limits of the storage account, what have I used so far against those storage account limits? And as I go and create those file shares, notice it's giving me these recommendations, but I can manually change the values to what I can use, and it's gonna track. It won't let me create more over multiple file shares than the actual storage account can support. And what this also does mean because of this is I actually can create um, shares up to 256 tebibytes instead of the 100 tebibyte limit. I can go up to 50,000 IOPS and five gigabytes per second of throughput. So that's higher than the regular uh, pay-as-you-go options. So uh, a, a pretty cool new uh, capability there. I also get monitoring at the file share level instead of the storage account level. Moving on, on the database side. So one of the big features of Azure Managed PostgreSQL Flexible is the huge number of configurable parameters that are available to be tuned along with a bunch of other HA and more, more, more flexible options around its usage. So what they've added is a number of new performance related values that I can go and change. I'm not gonna go through them all, but there's things like hash mem multiplier, I can modify log min durations. Um, there's a whole bunch of things about log parameters, max length, max length on errors, there's sample rates, there's vacuum fail save. There's a whole bunch of new things I can go and modify to make the database perform uh, exactly as I want to. So moving on, from the Azure portal role-based access control, when I'm assigning roles, it now integrates directly with privileged identity management. Remember, that's a P2 feature, so I still need a P2 license, but now it will give me the option to have just in time um, role assignment, so I'm eligible for it, instead of it being always on IE active. So actually, once again, we could jump over and take a look at this. So this will show up if I'm doing things at a subscription, um, a management group, or a resource group level. So if I just quickly uh, go and look at a resource group, if I do my access control, just as normal, and I wanna add a new role assignment, and I'm really just gonna pick anything, it doesn't matter. But the point is, you'll see this now assignment type. And so now, I have this option as eligible. So this means it's hooking into PIM and I have to go and activate. And there's other things I can then do around, hey, it can be a time bound assignment. I could go and configure PIM policy if I was actually using this, but it's just helping us drive those best practices. Because remember, typically I don't want to have, especially privileged roles just available all the time. I would much rather I activate it when I need it and then it goes away again. So with this integration, it makes it easier to follow those best practices of just enough and just in time um, directly in the portal. And that was it. Um, again, pretty quick update, but I think some really nice features. Uh, until next video, take care.